Welcome everyone to another episode of Streamed and Screened, an entertainment podcast about movies and TV from Lee Enterprises. I'm Terry Lipschitz, a senior producer at Lee and co-host of the program with our band leader, Bruce Miller, editor of the Sioux City Journal and a longtime entertainment reporter. So if you're John Lennon, does that make me Ringo? Paul McCartney. Oh, I'm McCartney. You get to be the big one. Why not? (laughs) Go for the good one, right? Exactly. So music. Taylor. This is the week. This is the week. Did you know this? If you were a Swifty, you would know these kinds of things. And that is that Taylor Swift's movie is coming out in the next week. And it's based on her era's tour. What I like to look at this as, those of us who couldn't afford or get tickets to her tour will be able to see it without having to really bust a hump. That's the best part to me about concert films is that it's a great way to get you to the show if you can't get to the show. Because sometimes, like some of these tour stops, and I mean, you're in Iowa, so for you, how often does, I mean, you'll get shows, sure, come to Iowa, but- But not something this big. Right. Yeah, you got to travel. You got to go to Chicago or or Minneapolis. I had friends tell me they spent $12,000 to see Taylor Swift. Holy cow. $12,000. Someday this will sound like I'm absurd thinking that that's a lot of money. But in this day, it's a lot of money. That It factors in the price of the tickets, the cost of getting there, the hotel room you have to have. I mean, it's like, I don't know that there's anybody on this earth that I would spend $12,000 to see. I don't have that kind of spending cash. (laughs) But knowing that it is coming out on film, on DVD, I'm sure eventually, all those kinds of things. It's an opportunity for all of us to enjoy whatever it was that was put out there and then maybe be even a little more critical about what they saw because I think they were all caught up in the enthusiasm of the moment. So I don't know. Maybe it isn't that good. Maybe 44 songs is too many. Who knows? It sounds like, from what I've heard, it's a really good show. I've seen a lot of clips of it. If you like Taylor Swift, I think it's definitely... A show you want to see. I, I I keep hearing 44 songs, but it's also, it's not like she performs them in full. Yeah, but... There's some some snippets here and there, and she kind of goes through the eras. No word if there's ranch dressing involved. Did you hear about this? No. No, so she's dating, or or at least seeing Travis Kelsey from the Kansas... You can't sure. escape that, right? Oh, right, right. So, there, so every little thing she does now gets dissected, and on social media... They were looking when she was at the Chiefs game in her luxury suite. Somebody spotted a picture of her with a chicken finger on a plate with what appeared to be ketchup and then a white substance that was labeled as seemingly ranch. Seemingly <laughs> ranch. <laughs> so ranch dressing companies are are like running with it. You know, Taylor eats ranch dressing. Who knew that she had such clout, right? <laughs> right. It's crazy. Anything she does. When she was here, she did play here way back in the early, early days when she was considered a country artist, if sure. you dare say that. And the thing I found most amazing about her is that she didn't do her T-shirt in one style. She did the look of it in like five different colors. So these fans would want all five of them. And yep. I thought that is a brilliant marketing decision by somebody that you weren't just getting the tour shirt, you were getting all of them. Because yes. if I'm gonna get one, I gotta have them all. What color do I pick? How do I pick? What am I gonna do? So marketing genius. I think she's far more skilled at selling herself than she is at anything else. And that is not a diss. That means that she is just a genius at it. Right. She should be teaching this at Harvard. Well, you know, with me, I'm a, a record collector and because and, you've seen my music collection and right. stuff in the background. Taylor, it, it extends to releasing physical media. So with the album, actually all of her recent albums, she'll release it on vinyl on a standard black edition. Limited and then edition, probably. Limited, but well, the black is always, you know, that's standard. You can get that okay. anytime you want. But then there is a different colored version that you can buy at Target. And then... You can buy, you know, four different versions with four different album covers on four different colors through her website. And she puts them up at these intervals, like for the next 48 hours only, 
you can buy this one and then it goes away and it, and then people freak out because they're like you know you're making me buy it multiple times and you're charging me shipping multiple times you know why can't you just put them all up but people will do that they will i've seen people on social media sharing out you know she's only got you know it's not like she's got 35 albums you know it's it's like she's got a solid catalog of, of like a dozen different albums or so but each one has like five or six or ten variants like you could literally have wow. a collection of 200 taylor swift records and it's just you know like a dozen albums at this point which is, is kind of unreal that is so crazy unreal. and people buy it. like taylor's army they will buy it and it's insane and, and i like as i said i'm a, I'm a record collector i do have multiple copies of certain albums but it's less about like i need a black version and i need a green version and a red version it's like i've got you know the original pressing an early pressing of born to run by bruce springsteen i have a japanese copy i have a uk copy they're pressed in different places so the sound might be a little bit different are they unplayed do you like keep them so that nobody touches them no i i play them so they're all and that's a little bit of the difference with like some of the Taylor Swift fans is they they might play one copy, but then they've got 13 that sit on a shelf or they hang on a wall or something. That could end up being the Beanie Babies of our era. It's going to be. It's, or it's, era. Should I say eras? Uh, eras, yes. Beanie, Beanie Babies of our eras. So, but yeah, I like shameless self-promotion, Bruce. If you do want to check me out on social media, my Instagram handle is at vinyl underscore terry and you can just see what what music i'm listening to at I, will any given moment. I will look that's check great it out check it out the beehive is also or the bay hive i should say is going to have its film in december so beyonce yes. you know she's once she sees what taylor does she's got to do one better it's uh well and, and her strategy is a little different so with taylor she's a little bit on hiatus at the moment she's taking a, a small break in her tour she's football and, season right well, she goes, I think in another month, she heads down to South America. She's going to do like Argentina hey. and, and, and all that. So her film is going to drop October 13th, I believe. And then with uh, with Queen B, her tour is over. So she's going to drop hers on, I believe it's December 1st. And it's going to air in theaters on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays for about four weeks. So it's going to be like a limited run, month of December, but her tour is done, so it's not about, you know... You can't you can go pick back. One or, you can't, like, right. This is, you either saw it and want to relive the moment, or you missed it, and here's your opportunity. Whereas with, with Taylor, this is just kind of, it's just another opportunity to see her, and then you can, you know, fly off to South America, or you can wait for her to circle back in North America next summer. We've got to spend $12,000 and follow her around. Yeah. And then go to all the uh, Chiefs games to make sure that we see that in case she happens to wave to the audience from the yes. guide box. You know how it is. Well, I must tell you, I have followed these kinds of films for years. You know, going back to Woodstock was probably the first good concertish film because it did give you a sense of it and made me glad I never went there because I don't think I could have withstood mud and all that kind of right. whatever crap was there. But- I was invited, I was in California one summer, and I was invited, I think it was summer, I'm, I'm, it either was su summer or January, but it was the um, uh, preview of One Direction's film. One Direction had a film called This Is Us, I think it is, This Is Us. Okay. And they were having this sneak in The Grove, which is a kind of upscale shopping center in Los Angeles. Okay. And somehow the word got out that this was going on and all these little girls who were fans of One Direction gathered there. They were outside this theater like you couldn't believe. It was like the scene in Frankenstein where the, the villagers are going to storm the castle because they want in and they had heard that One Direction was going to be there, that they were going to turn up for this uh, this screening that they weren't invited to, that they couldn't get into. And so I'm sitting in the theater, right? And we get the manager of the theater looking just really whipped. And he says, whatever you do, do not leave your seat. If you leave your seat and you leave the, the theater, 
you will not get your seat back because if somehow they break in and they start sitting in the seats where there aren't people, we can't kick them out. We have, we have no way of doing it. So please do not leave your seat. And we heard people pounding at the door outside. And this made news. You'll find if you want to go back and look it up, pounding at the door, insisted that Harry Styles was in there somewhere and we were keeping them from meeting him. It was unlike any situation I've ever been in that's a preview of anything. Was the movie okay? I have no clue. I I know that <laughs> I, I was worried that I was going to be beaten by a 12-year-old <laughs> at some point because I was in there sitting and watching this movie that meant so much to them, but they weren't. Wow. That's, and they didn't show up, right? They were out there, but they, they the cops came and the cops kept him and got him out of the theater so they were not in the theater at all. Oh. And then when we walked out, you know, you could see that there was like this, hmm, what did you, who was in there? Who was in there with you? Did you see Niall? Was he in there with you? You know, they were, the kids were real questioning. I thought they could kill people. I think they really could kill people. They probably like, could. <laughs> if you're determined, if you're determined. And so then I said, oh, it was wonderful. You've got to see this film. It's just so good. Yeah. Yeah. Woodstock, oh, though, that, that's probably the first concert film I had ever seen. It was actually one, I, I'm trying to think when my dad let me see it, because it's a little, you know, there's some language in it. There's some drug use in it. There's definitely some nudity in it. Now, right. it may have even been the first movie I had seen with, like, nudity but it's really a fascinating look at, at what went on i i think my dad always had a real connection with it too because he he bought tickets with friends to woodstock you're kidding yeah he didn't get to it he he got stuck on the new york state thruway and eventually had to turn around because they just they, they couldn't they left a little too late you know on whatever day it was and and by that time it was it was crazy People had stormed the grounds. It, it had become a free concert, and he, uh, you know, he was angry. So he, what he did, what any other person who bought oh, a ticket to something, he ripped up the tickets. He no, he sent it back and got a refund, and he regrets oh, it. No. He regretted it for the rest of his life because it was, you know, he wished he could have had that ticket stub of of like, I actually bought a ticket and I couldn't get there. But yeah, it was it was one of it was all of his favorite bands were playing. You know, it, it's just, it's an incredible thing. So I, I think he always wanted us to, you know, my siblings, to really feel that connection with him, with Woodstock. But it's a fascinating film, too, because Woodstock, up until that movie, was just a financial disaster. And it took that movie to kind of, like, help them break even, basically. Well, and it showed you how acts that they weren't counting on turned out to be the stars, really. Right. Of, yeah, yeah made their their fortunes for them whereas yeah. other ones that they were counting on it's like well not so sure here this is not necessarily the star yeah and you know who um uh, not a director of the film but one of the film editors of it do you know who what famous uh was director? this Scorsese? Scorsese was one of his earliest uh works was as a film editor on Woodstock see what happens yeah. see what happens when you're available and you can get to that place right <laughs> But he had uh, gotten there only, but he wouldn't have gotten a T-shirt because they probably weren't selling any. Yeah, but Marty uh, and you know we we know Martin Scorsese by Marty, I mean because we're, Mar we're buddies. He's, spoke, he's one of our pals, right? Right. But he's got a long history in doing movies, documentaries about you know musicians. He directed the Last Waltz, which was right. the final concert of the band. He did. Uh, no Direction Home, which was the documentary about the early life of Bob Dylan. It was it was that they captured him leaving Minnesota and then going to New York and kind of rising through the folk scene. And then it kind of ended when he um, when he plugged in. He did a, a documentary on uh, George Harrison. Um, did you ever see the one he did called? Uh, Rolling Thunder Review, a Bob Dylan story. Oh. Do you remember that one? No. Oh. So so he directed this, and it was the most bizarre thing. So it's based on Dylan's concert tour during, I think it was 1975. Uh, it was a transitional stage in Dylan's career, 
but he went out with this like huge group of people of you know it was like 20 people on stage it was almost like a circus Dylan painted his face. He had like white makeup on every night and wore a big oh, wow. hat. And and it captures a lot of those performances. But the the film that Scorsese did was almost part fiction because it plays into the myth that is Dylan. And it talks like uh, I think Sharon Stone was in it, and she talks about how she was a groupie during, but she wasn't. She didn't. She wasn't on the tour with Dylan at all. But it's it's they added in for whatever reason different moments of fiction to what was actually supposed to be a documentary of his tour in the mid seventies. So it's kind of a crazy, oh my, crazy goodness. thing. Yeah, yeah. How powerful is the Cox Network? So powerful that one day the internet will let your doctor perform miracles from thousands of miles away. Connecting to remote operating room. Giving a whole new meaning to the term house call. Operation complete. The Cox Network. With gig speeds everywhere. It's internet built for tomorrow, today. Cox, bringing us closer. In Cox serviceable areas, speeds vary and are not guaranteed. Cox terms apply. Other restrictions may apply. One that I'm fascinated by is the Michael Jackson one. Mm. You know, it's supposed to be about his last concert tour, and they kind of created it into that tour. I mean, if you were there, you would see all of the numbers that they were planning to do. But you realize in the course of that somewhere, there was no way he was going to be able to produce this every night. He couldn't. He didn't have the energy. He didn't have the stamina. I mean, it was fascinating when they did each number. But you'd think somebody's got to go get, you know, some oxygen at some point because it's just way too much. And it, it, it's telling because it shows how how talented he was, but also how old he was. And the idea that you can do that, you know, maybe past your prime is, you know, unreal. But it, if you haven't seen that one, please... Please watch it because it's just, um, it's yeah, unbelievable. That, this is a, it. This oh. is it, right. Yeah. yeah, and that came out in 2009. I, I remember watching that one, and it was a really, it was really fascinating because it took you inside of the prep for the tour. But it was also really sad, too, because you were seeing his decline, basically, too. Yeah. You know, at, at the time, like, obviously, in retrospect, when you see it, you're like, well, okay, you know, that makes sense. But at the time, you probably didn't even realize that he was nearing the end of his life. Right. Well, and I I think it's one of those things where he thought too, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be able to do this. This is, this isn't going to happen. You know, instead of doing it once and doing it for film it, and then you never have to do it again. Why not? You know? Right. Right. Uh, do you remember when HBO was real big about doing these live uh, specials and there was a Diana Ross one live from Central Park and it started to rain and it was like the worst rain ever and not as bad as the one they've had recently but it was bad so that the people were like well do we she just kept on going she yeah. was the energizer bunny and wouldn't let it up and come on everybody sing with me you know and it's like <laughs> wow this is yeah. this is real but it is I think they like that document of their time because it is a way to mark certain hallmarks of their career. And then also it's a way for fans to say, you know what? She or he really was that good. Yeah. I, I won't watch every concert documentary out there, but if it's a musician that I, I at least either like or respect, I like to check it out because it's it's always a good time capsule to kind of see what happens. You know, an interesting one for me, is uh, uh, the song remains the same? The documentary concert film uh, about the uh, Led Zeppelin's tour sure. from 1973, yeah. where they filmed it at Madison Square Garden, and and here is that band at really the height of their popularity. Right, it's middle of their career, things are crazy, and it captures the moment. And that came out in '76, and then years years later, they did another concert film and it's called celebration day and that came out in 2012 now this is after john bonham had died and and after john bonham died the band broke up and they swore we're we're never getting back together 
And there were little things here and there, like, you know, Robert Plant and Jimmy Page did a, a side project together, but they never really went back out. I think they had that one off, like at like Live Aid, where they, they came together and played, but they never again really did any sort of tour or anything. They swore we're never going to reunite. But then they ended up doing uh, a benefit concert at the O2 Arena in, in London. And it was just a one off. And they said, this, this we're going to do it. We're, we're doing this benefit, you know, is for one of their early managers or, or, or promoters. And, you know, so that's the only reason we're going to do it. And it sold out in minutes. And the cool thing about it, though, is that they brought in Jason Bonham, who is John Bonham's son, to play on drums. And I always thought it was cool watching that concert because, you know, you knew that this is this is it. You know, you're not going to be able to see him again. They're never going to get back again. But they opened it up with the song uh, Good Times, Bad Times. And it was very much like a drum driven song. So it's, you know, it's we're going to open it up. We're going to let Jason Bonham kind of take center stage in honor of his dad kind of thing. And and then they kind of tore through, you know, like 16 songs after that. So it was a really nice moment. And there's a band that, you know, kind of had two at, at two ends of the spectrum, like one at the height of craziness in the 70s. And then one is, you know, we're we're like grandparents to now. And Dang. and, you know, but this is us. We're going to get back to one more time. We're going to honor a friend of ours and and do it one more time. And I thought that was pretty cool. Well, and we look at the Beatles really did concert films, too. They just did them more like music videos. Right. Uh, with all of their kind of help and you name it. Uh, let it be all that kind of stuff had a moment. They never really sat it down and and uh, did something that we're seeing a lot of now. But so we still have that that kind of record of their time on Earth. The Rolling Stones, however, had Give Me Shelter. And do you right. think in that? That was like, wow. Yeah. Those times, I don't know that I would have been eager to go to those concerts at the time. But in retrospect, as an older person with more, hopefully, smarts about what I'm doing, I can appreciate it much more than I would have at the time. I would have been yeah. worried about getting out. Are we right. getting out of time? Are, is the parking going to be bad? And do I have to worry about all that? You know what I mean? It's just so now it's it's fun, very a lot of fun to watch it, and especially when they're still they're still performing. You know, I'm sure yeah. every move they make now when they're in concert is photographed somewhere somehow. We didn't have social media back in the day, so everybody wasn't holding a phone up and um, recording it. They were just appreciating what it was at the time. The Beatles, it's an interesting example because they had several movies that are still popular to this day, you know, like A Hard Day's Night. And it really, there were concert elements within the film, but it was more of a traditional film, but it captured... Beatlemania at the height of Beatlemania. So if you weren't there in the 60s to experience Beatlemania, even though it's kind of a lighthearted film, you still got the essence of it. And then you got some of the goofiness and, in, in, you know, like with help and, and all that. But it's really a, a shame with them because they stopped touring in the mid 60s because they couldn't hear themselves. And right. if you ever get a chance, um, I have like a bootleg DVD oh. of their Shea Stadium concert. And it's the craziest thing. It's like a 25-minute concert. I mean, that's all their concerts were back there. They would do, you know, 20 songs in 25 minutes, and then they were done. Wow. You know, I, I, I've been to the theater, the Ed Sullivan Theater, where they did their big performance on, on television, the first one. And the place is small. It's really small. And I remember seeing people in the balcony, like they were jumping up and down and were so excited that they thought it was going to, it was going to come down and you realize, wow, we were really kind of duped back in the day thinking that it was just this huge Madison Square Garden kind of experience. And it was just a small theater. But, you know, the cameras made it look like it was much bigger than it actually was. If you ever get a chance in New York City, you take the NBC Studios tour and they usually will take you to a couple different sets, uh, including it's like they Every always do song. Saturday Night Live, and then they'll give you like one or two. And I remember when I took the tour one time, we went to the Saturday Night Live set, and it's you're just kind of blown away because you realize you actually can't see some of, you know, if you're in that studio audience, because of the way they have to arrange the floor, 
they might be filming part of it off to the side where the audience can't actually see it because you and you have to watch it on monitors. You just see like where they come out for the monologue and you see where the band performs. But then some of the other configurations are all over the place. And then we also went out to, um, I think it was Conan O'Brien's when he was still, it was before he got, you know, the the Tonight Show and, sure. he, and he had that uh, late night program. And I remember going there and, you know, we saw the Max Weinberg drum kit sitting out there and, and Conan's desk, but it's tiny. It's a tiny little theater. Right. Oh, yeah. Sneaky. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned Saturday Night Live. I was lucky enough to have been there. During the the early years, I I saw an episode that um, I don't know if you remember any of these things, but there was a dance that Gilda Radner and Steve Martin did, and they were like going all around the the whole area, and they came near me, and I was able to get on camera at some point with them. So if you ever have access to that, go back and look. But it was fascinating because you could not see all of the skits there could be a skit right down below you right but you you can't lean in and look at that and so you'd basically get to see a couple and that's about it but the the flurry of activity that's going on between the skits is just it, it's amazing and then the sound is really really good for the uh the guest artist whoever is singing that week or whatever it's really really good but um, yeah, and, and so I, I, a couple of times I've gotten to go to Saturday Night Live, it's like the most impossible ticket to get because yeah. uh, they will, at best, you're going to get a rehearsal ticket at this point because they do a rehearsal before they do the the final show. Right. And they'll let, they, somehow they'll let people in there, but you really need to know somebody if you're if you're going to go to the actual show itself. So put that on a bucket list. It's 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 really worth it. You had mentioned back a little bit earlier about the O2, this huge venue in London. Right. And, you know, every year it seems they're rerunning this on PBS, and that's the Les Mis anniversary special. Mm. And it's just unbelievable. I love the show Les, Les Miserables as a musical. It's wonderful. But this, they combined a whole bunch of old stars, people who had been in it before, made this kind of masterful thing. And then you saw these people walking up the aisles of this show. And it was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. And those are those once in a lifetime experiences that somehow need to be captured on film. But the O2 is a place where they all play at some point. Look at all the things they did when Prince Charles and um, oh, sure. when Queen Elizabeth had her anniversary. You name it. They did something there. And it's a place I'd love to go to just to see what it's like in person. Yeah, that would be a fun one. You know, and then you think about like entertainment destinations now too with the sphere in Las Vegas sure. with U2. And U2, because U2 is such a visual band that they're able to utilize the interior. I mean, that's just amazing. It's just a giant LED screen, basically. Right. But you know, they had a concert film as well. I don't know. Do you remember Rattle and Hum? Oh, yes. I think we got, didn't we get it free? If you had like some Apple product, they gave it to you. I don't know. You might have, but no, they, I, I think you're, that, that might be something else. But Rattle and the Hum came out in, uh, I think it was 1988. And it was, it was a, a combination uh, album. Li it was like a live album that came out after the Joshua Tree. And it also had a companion film that went with it. The companion film, some people love it. Some people hate it. I don't know if there's very many people that are kind of like in the middle on this one. It's yeah. really bizarre. So it's on one hand, you get a lot of performances from the Joshua Tree tour, which is really at that point, you know, they had a few earlier albums that did well. They were, they were, you know, critically acclaimed, but they didn't necessarily explode commercially. But the Joshua Tree exploded commercially and they had huge hits. So they, they documented parts of this tour and they shot a lot of it in black and white, but then near the end they, they went into color, but then they had these intermittent weird side journeys, you know, where they went to Graceland and they, they talked about their love for Elvis and, you know, they met with BB King and they did this and they did. And it was just kind of a strange document of, of the time. Like it wasn't, 
I would have been happier with just give me 25 songs of a straight U2 concert. If you got to take a few performances from a few different shows, so be it. But uh, I, I don't know. I could probably have done without, you know, the side commentary. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, it's also, it's very, you know, I love U2 and I've seen them in concert and, and I, I have all their albums, but, you know, Bono has a certain way about him, I guess is, is a way of saying it. And, and it's just like they're a little bit too over the top sometimes, even even for me. And and I think I think Rattle and Hum really it sums up that time at least. Even though all those little pop stars, Hannah Montana had right. a show, right? Um, Bieber had one. I think it was three D. So yep. Katy Perry, you name them, they all get these movies at some point. And it's somebody saying, you know, here's how we can make the budget on that tour that didn't go so well we'll put out a movie and then we'll make up the difference that we lost in going you know having that big set piece that you had there was a great mockumentary about madonna's tour remember how madonna had the the cone bra and yeah. all that kind of stuff? And she was and julie brown not the julie brown that you remember from mtb but a, a different julie brown who was a comedian did her spoof of madonna's tour and oh. it was so, I, I think she called herself Medusa or something. Okay. Um, yeah. But if you ever get to see that, it is such a hoot. It makes fun of these in the best way. The <laughs> best way. And Madonna had to have loved it. And she's another one who should look at those things and say, I'm glad I have this document. I really am. Because I don't know that her tours now are as iconic as they should be. Gaga. She has done things. She's done films or or specials, but I don't know that she's done one of these kind of big, big, big movie things that right. would have told all or showed all or whatever. Yeah, and maybe she's ripe for one. Maybe you know which one I I really like too. And this is an opportunity because I couldn't get to New York, and and and, and I'm a huge Springsteen fan. And then this is like my other on Broadway. Yeah, my in my other sh- shameless self promotion, I have another Instagram account called at Bruce Springsteen Collection, where I document all of the Springsteen albums in my collection, and and I'm not just talking about the regular stuff. I've got some some things that were not officially released that I show off on this thing. But does Bruce know? Does Bruce? <laughs> he he knows this stuff is out there. Okay, um, but. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm a huge hardcore. I've seen I've seen him in concert 13, 14 times at this point. Why didn't so, you go to the Broadway show? Come on. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted to, but the cost, you know, the cost for tickets. I got to travel from the Midwest to the city. The it's five thousand dollars. That's it's, all you need. Yeah, it's it's an expensive show. So uh, when when Netflix made the deal to air and you know one of the performances is Springsteen on Broadway, it was a really good opportunity. And I would have loved to have gone to the Walter Kerr Theater to see it live. But I think in this type of setting, the way they filmed it, you felt like you were right there. It was it was a very well done documentary ish, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, um, it captured the moment. You know, it was it was kind of like when um, with Hamilton, because if you couldn't see the original cast, you at least got to see it on Apple TV. And I think that was a good you know, second opportunity. And I think that's what this is. I told you my story about Hamilton, right? That I was determined to see Hamilton no matter what. No, I don't think I heard this one. Oh, I, do you mind if I go ahead? A little story. The thing about me is I have to see the original cast. I have to see the original actor in a Broadway show, or I don't feel like I, if it's a big thing. Sure. And I knew that Hamilton was going to be a big thing even before Hamilton was a spark on anybody's radar. And then it got it got out there. And I thought, I've got to go, but when am I going and how do I get tickets? And it was like this whole thing where I couldn't get the tickets. The tickets were just outrageous. And I decided I was going to go on StubHub. Oh. And so StubHub, I went on and it was like a thousand something for the tickets. And am I going to spend a thousand dollars? And then I started rationalizing all these things. Well, life is short. You're not going to be around that much longer. You want to see it. You should go. The cat, the original cast was breaking up after that. I mean, I, it, I was right. rationalizing, right? It played out. You played it out like 15 steps and you're like, I'm on board. And yep. it got down to the point where it was 
$777. Oh, you got to do it. And I did it. I jumped and then I was at a hotel and we had to have, you know how this kind of, this thing is where you print out the tickets, but you're not really sure about all this. And you think, oh, they're going to take me to the cleaners and I'm going to lose $700 and it's going to be just the worst, right? Yep. And so I, we, I get to the business office at the hotel and they said, yeah, you know, these are pretty good. You should be all right. You shouldn't have a problem. But if I were you, I'd get to the theater early. Because if somebody sold this ticket twice, which could happen, yep, you won't be the one who gets in. It'll right. go with the one who got in before you. I made a beeline to that theater as fast as I could. And when I heard that of the ticket, it was like, yes. So I get to my seat and the seat was really, really, really good. And I'm talking to the people next to me. And there was a family from Los Angeles who came because the daughter had been listening to the album all along and wanted to see this, right? This was her goal. And they gave up going to any other shows. They weren't going to any kind of theme parks. They weren't doing anything but Hamilton. And they spent $10,000. <laughs> and they were sitting next to me. And then we talked to people like in the row before us. They spent nothing. Somebody handed them tickets at the theater. Oh. So there were all these kind of stories that were going around among the people. And you felt lucky. You felt like I have won the lottery. I am here. And then you hear dun, 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 dun. And you think this is like the, the most unbelievable experience I've ever been in my life. It was everything. And then a little bit more. And I'll tell you, I, um, and in intermission, I ran to the, the merchandise table and bought $200 worth of crap. <laughs> Just because I wanted to prove that I had been to Hamilton, right? <laughs> so it, it was my thing. And I realized, you know what? It was money well spent. It was really money well spent. Now, when I saw the Apple version of, or I mean the Disney version, Disney Plus right. version yep. of, of uh, Hamilton, it was perfect. It lived up to all of the things that I remember because I, after that cast, the original cast left, I did go see it again. And it did not live up to the the hype. But having seen the original cast and then seeing the original cast do the filmed version of it, it was, if you want to know how good it was, watch that. It was very good. And I think they did a great job of capturing that whole moment. But yeah. That's cool. My Hamilton story. So for the next year after that, I got more Hamilton crap from people because they said, well, you're the one that really likes Hamilton, don't you? Here's a Hamilton whatever. But I, I had talked to Lin-Manuel Miranda before he was even writing it. He was on a TV series as a, like a third stringer. And I said, well, what are you working on? Because he had done some other stuff for the theater. And that, if you know anything about me, I'm just a hardcore theater person. I, I live for that. And he said, well, I'm working on a little thing I call the Hamilton Mixtape. It's a show about Alexander Hamilton, but it's done with rap and hip hop and that kind of stuff. He says, we'll see where it goes. And I'll look where it went. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. It's like, I don't know, you know it, it, may, it may pan out. Who knows? You know, It's a fascinating story. And then to even take it further, while he was doing Hamilton, he was writing the songs for Moana. Oh. He would do Zoom calls with the directors of Moana, who one of them happens to be from Sioux City. And really? he would tell me about how, yeah, he'd come out, you know, after, before they started the show or during an intermission or whatever. And they would like work out, well, this song needs to be this and this song needs to be that. Okay, I'll work on it and I'll get you another one. And then he'd go out and do the show. That's so, crazy. Yeah, it's, wow. it's weird. But there's your, your two cents worth on those kind of direct to the screen versions. But I think, you know what? I think these are ways for all of us to enjoy entertainment that we maybe don't have the access to. Absolutely. It's a, an affordable way. Yep. And you still get all the bells and whistles. And even if you had a bad seat at the at the show itself, if you did go, here's a way to see things that maybe you didn't see. Yeah. And it's a cool way to, because it captures the moment of the time. So if, you know, if you're like me, who, who I'm in my later 40s and I was born after Woodstock, I can see what, you know, people of my parents' age look like and acted like 
as as youngsters and realize that you know some of the things that they yelled at me for they were doing them also oh. back in yep as someone who was around yep i will tell you they were just as bad if not worse than we see kids today yep exactly and then i look back at something like 1991 the film the year punk broke which looks at bands like you know sonic youth and nirvana when they exploded in the early 90s and i watched those and i'm like Oh, did I really dress that way in high school? Yeah. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, you no, know, it's fascinating. I was talking to a, a college student today, and she was doing a, a project for one of her design classes. And she says, I am going back to the 70s. And I'm <laughs> trying to kind of conjure all of those things that were big in the 70s. And I said, you know, some of these things that you're coming up with, weren't in the 70s so you just have to be a little careful what, <laughs> because i don't remember this stuff and i remember the 70s like nobody you do yep you absolutely remember them so again we've got october 13th taylor swift's the eras tour film coming out Beyonce has her film coming out in december and check out some of these these films that we talked about today you know great opportunities like you know woodstock rattle and hum the last waltz a lot of like scorsese has done a lot of if you're into marty like like i am you know he's got a lot of things besides the uh the the gangster films he's he, he loves music and and it plays into all of his films and he's done quite a few so a lot of a lot of and good he's things got a there. New movie coming up so there and he's go. got a new and he's got a new movie coming up and then we have another episode coming out next week you have an interview with that right with goosebumps yeah get ready we're getting closer to halloween and they've rebooted goosebumps you know they had a series where they would do a different book for each episode now they've created a kind of a mashup where they put the characters together and they're telling stories from four or five different books in the course of a season and you'll get a chance to hear the producers talk about why they did what they did with this and it's a little more adult than you may remember the goosebumps book being so look for that. That's next week when we come back on Streamed and Screened. Sounds good. So we'll talk about Goosebumps and we'll talk about maybe some other family friendly ish kind of Halloween things that we can dive into. If you must. If you're not, we're talking about Saw. <laughs> I will tap out. If we're talking horror movies, I am tapping out before won't we even get Saw. started. We won't do Saw. None of that stuff. I, I like to get a solid night's sleepers. I don't, I don't need the horror things flashing through my head. This stuff's scary. I don't like scary things. Yeah, we'll play the, the Springsteen white noise machine and you'll be able to go play. Sounds good. All right, we'll be back again next week with another episode of Streamed and Screened. <laughs>